If you like this video, please consider subscribing to our channel. Today, I'm going to talk about how we are shifting to zero touch production here at Mercari. So my name is Dylan Lau, and I'm a software engineer on the Platform DX team at Mercari. So today, we're going to start with what is zero touch production, our roadmap to implementing zero touch production, and our first system that we implemented to achieve zero touch production, including why we started with that system. So what is zero touch production anyway? The name implies that it has something to do with the production environment. And to help explain it, imagine this scenario. Say an engineer or SRE needs to do some manual operation in production. Say something like running some particular binary. No big deal. So they copy the binary and their configuration over to production and run it. But they have some setting in their configuration that is not suited for production, like skipping verification prompts. Perhaps they are running the binary with some wrapper script and it has some error, like forgetting to update a service account string. Or maybe they copied the wrong command and now they're running some completely different command. Or maybe they wanted to test run it first, but they forgot to set the dry run flag. The bottom line is that a lot can go wrong here and that's, that's fine. We are, we're all human and humans make mistakes. But because we are prone to making these mistakes, we need to prevent ourselves from making them in the first place. Let's imagine another scenario. Say an engineer or SRE's credentials are compromised, or perhaps they're feeling a little bit dissatisfied and malicious. Because they have write access in production, they can easily do whatever they want, including taking a service down. And in the case of a malicious actor, they may also know how to take a service down completely undetected. So these are two types of scenarios that zero touch production aims to solve. Zero touch production is a concept where all changes in production are done via automation, safe proxies, or an audited break glass system. With automation, all production changes are done by a system which is granted the least required privileges so that it is not capable of doing anything harmful. The system's code can be validated for auditing and the permissions are limited to only what is required. This automation system can only manage a small subset of production assets and access control is tightly restricted. But it will cover the majority of production operations that a user would need to do and can do it on behalf of that user. Safe proxies are systems that are in between a user and production environment and validate operations that a user wants to do in production. Basically, a safe proxy will ensure that changes to the production environment are audited and approved by someone else. A typical unrestricted production environment may grant engineers with a broad range of permissions. This means that while it gives users more flexibility, they would be able to perform various operations without any peer reviews, and there would be great risks involved if the users turn malicious or their credentials are compromised. With safe proxies, we can mitigate these risks by requiring reviews for operations that modify the production environment to proceed. We require code reviews for code to enter production Similarly, we should require reviews for operations that affect production. Lastly, a break glass system is an audited sy system to perform manual operations for emergency situations such as production outages when automation nor safe proxies are feasible. Although we can cover the majority of operations with automation or safe proxies, there will still be times where manual operation is required. This is basically what a typical production environment is. Users have unrestricted write access, except in this case, it is not the default state of production 
and it is the last resort for doing production operations. With zero touch production, automation and safe proxies are the primary methods of doing production operations and the break glass system is the fallback mechanism for when automation and safe proxies don't work. So with this concept of zero touch production in mind, let's review our current state of production. At Mercari, we have all of our microservices configured in a Terraform monorepo. And also, we have SRE as a practice, not a dedicated role. This means that teams have full ownership of their microservice and they handle running their service as well. This also means that each team is responsible for maintaining uptime of their service and handling incidents. In the early days of adopting and maturing SRE practices internally, many took the simpler route and had all team members or a small subset of team members have write permissions in production by default for a fast response to incidents. Of course, this means that they are vulnerable to the two potential scenarios that we described earlier, error from manual operations and malicious intent or compromised credentials. Based on our previous state of production and our desired state of zero touch production, we needed to come up with a roadmap to transition to our desired state. Our first goal was to employ the principle of least required privileges for engineers. In zero touch production, this means that everyone should have read only permissions in production by default. However, all production tasks should still be possible to perform. The production tasks should be possible via automation, safe proxies or an approval system, or a break glass system. With this in mind, let's take a look at our end goal of zero touch production. The end goal is to have users with view permissions by default, and they must use automation or an approval system to get edit permissions. Covering every potential operation with automation in the first implementation is extremely difficult. Plus, even after automating operations, there will still be times where manual operation is required. Thus, an approval system for manual operations should be our first priority. The approval system should be used by all engineers to get elevated permissions temporarily to perform required tasks while requiring approval from another person. A Terraform monorepo could be used for this purpose. Approvals are required to merge, and write permissions can be granted through code. However, this system has some issues. The first main issue is that the process is slow. Engineers need to create a PR and merge the PR, and CI needs to run on the PR as well as when the PR is merged. The second issue is that it is easy to forget. After granting write permissions, an engineer may forget to revert their PR. The last issue is it is a single point of failure. If GitHub or our CI is down, we cannot get write permissions. Thus, the GitHub process can serve as our approval system on paper, but these issues make it not really ideal. Therefore, while we keep this method of getting write permissions available, we also created a fast approval system with automatic revocation and is independent from GitHub. In Mercari, this temporary role granting system is called Carrier. Carrier, named after an aircraft carrier, is our system for quickly getting temporary elevated permissions. A user can request some permissions and a reviewer can approve this request to grant these permissions for a limited amount of time after which they are automatically revoked. The analogy behind the name is basically this. A user or requester requires permissions to do some task. A reviewer will then check the request and give them permission to take off, to do the task. But since they are out at sea with no other places to land and limited fuel, they will need to return eventually. So the temporary role granting system consists of four major components all of which work together to act as the approval system. 
The first component is Carrier itself, which is a custom Kubernetes controller. This handles the main business logic of a request and a review and orchestrates the entire lifecycle of the request and all of the components to behave as our approval system. The second component is Clutch. Clutch is an open source front-end platform from Lyft, whose primary purpose is to do infrastructure operations on behalf of a user. With respect to Carrier, it is the primary interface for a user to create requests and reviews. The third component is Config Connector. This is a GKE add-on from Google, which creates GCP resources declaratively in our Kubernetes cluster. This add-on has different custom resource definitions for CRDs for every supported GCP resource and watches these CRDs in our cluster and creates the actual GCP resource depending on the state of the CRD. The final component is our service catalog. We have an internal service catalog that collects and normalizes data about microservices. This information is exposed in the GraphQL API and is used to determine owners and contact links for a particular microservice. All these components work together to function as our temporary role granting system. So let's go through the lifecycle of a request to see how all of these components work together. First, a user will use Clutch to create the request. The user will fill out each field with what they need and create the request. Clutch will then create a role binding request object for the user in our Kubernetes cluster. Carrier watches objects of this type and will detect that the object has been created. It will then check our service catalog to confirm that the service exists and also retrieve the Slack alert channel for that service and sends a notification. A reviewer can then log into Clutch to approve or deny the request. Clutch will create a role binding request review object corresponding to that review. When a request is approved, Carrier creates an IAM policy member object for GCP permissions, a role binding object for Kubernetes. Kubernetes permissions are handled natively with the role binding object, whereas Config Connector will handle the GCP permissions. Config Connector will detect the new IAM policy member object and create the IAM binding in the target GCP project. Finally, Carrier will set the expiry time of the request to the approval time plus the request duration. When a request expires or is rejected, the IAM policy member and role binding objects are deleted if they exist, revoking any granted permissions immediately. With the implementation of Carrier, we had a functional approval system and could begin migrating all of our services. We started with migrating a few platform component microservices first for dog fooding purposes, before eventually migrating the remaining platform component services and then all other microservices. As part of the migration, for each service, we replaced the default write permissions in production with read and use carrier whenever we needed to get write permissions. After using Carrier for platform components for some time, we began migrating all other microservices, and today all microservices have been migrated to Carrier. Currently, there are approximately 100 Carrier requests per week across all microservices, which is still a significant improvement from having write permissions by default in all services. Reflecting back on the two example scenarios for Zero Touch production, Although human error remains a potential issue, we have effectively eliminated the second issue. We still have a very long way to go to reach our desired state of zero touch production. The first improvement is a period extension feature. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to our channel. We periodically upload videos focusing on Mercari engineers, the technologies that we use, and our culture. Thank you.